Hey, boo. Hey, boo. <sighs> Marco. Welcome back to the garden. It is the month of August. So we're going to be discovering the garden together this time because uh, I've actually just been away for two weeks and this is my first day back in the garden. So I'm just getting to grips with and discovering how much work there is to do, how long the to-do list is. And you can really see around me that the polytunnel is filled with plant life. It's really filled out because the harvest season is coming into its fullness now. So I wasn't surprised that Jason couldn't find me when he was looking for me because this is like a jungle in here. So we've passed what is known in Wales as Goyle Oust, or also known as uh, Lunasa in Irish culture or Lammas in England, which is that time at the 1st of August when we really officially enter what's known as the harvest season. So harvest season runs from the 1st of August, typically until the autumn equinox at the end of September. Um, and this is the time when all of the, the crops we associate with summer are coming into their fullness. So we've got tomatoes, aubergines, peppers, chilies, cucumbers, we've got our summer squash and all our outdoor vegetables. So every bed, and the whole space is kind of filling to bursting with food. And for the next several weeks, we're enjoying the bounty of the Welsh season's harvest. So in next month's video, we're gonna talk more about preserving and storing the harvest and working with the produce that we have in the kitchen. But this month, I wanted to talk to you about how we share our harvest with our community. So here at Glassbrem, we distribute our produce, we share our harvest through something called a Community Supported Agriculture or CSA scheme. Now this is a radically different, in some ways quite new, and in a lot of ways quite old way of sharing the produce with our community members, supporters, and people in the immediate local area. It's a model based on trust, mutual aid, and a relationship of real transparency between producers, growers, farmers, and their consumers, the people that eat their food. So for me, CSA really embodies those three core principles of permaculture, which is earth care, people care, and fair share. So earth care, it's a model that really supports the most agroecological, sustainable, regenerative approaches to growing food. People care, so it brings people into contact with the food that they eat, with the land that's growing their food, the ecology that's growing their food, and the people that grow it too. And it kind of creates this beautiful kind of community of practice around something that's so universal and shared and yet has become kind of commodified and separated from our daily life. So the very act of people coming together to maybe help to grow the food, to volunteer, come and pick up their produce, to enjoy the nutritional benefits of that food, the medicinal benefits, to understand more about food and cooking and uh, nutrition. All of these things contribute to that ethic of people care that we talk about in permaculture. And that fair share ethic is really important too. And through CSA, there's a really important spirit of mutual aid, food security, finding ways to distribute the produce fairly amongst all of our community members, not just those that can afford it. So for example, here at Glass Brem, we offer our veg box memberships on a sliding scale. So people pay what they can within a certain range to as best as we can make sure that our produce gets to anybody that wants it without cost being a barrier. The way CSA works for us is that people in our community within a 10 mile radius become members for the whole season. So they sign up upfront in advance um, on the acknowledgement that they're gonna get a weekly box of the freshest, most seasonal vegetables, whatever's coming out of the land that week. It's usually a mixture of between six and 10 items of veg, herbs, leafy greens, fruits, sometimes some wild food too. And really, yeah, really surrendering to the tumbling seasons of Wales to whatever's really being produced by the garden at that time through times of plenty and times of through more leaner times in the garden. So right now, obviously, we're getting quite a bumper box of loads of different types of produce, but come the winter, it gets a little bit leaner and people are really signing up to that reality of what it is to eat seasonally, what it is to eat locally and the food that's really available to us in our local area. We also saw through kind of through crises like COVID, the pandemic, uh, through the winter fuel crisis, petrol crises, and through various challenges that we've all been through in the last few years, that CSA is a really resilient model for communities to make sure that food is still available to people. And, you know, for example, our capacity to produce food and feed people actually increased during the pandemic. And we were able to continue to fill those boxes every week because we're not relying on expensive imports or inputs, we're not relying on cross country, cross, cross border trade. Everything we need is available here. All of our organic matter is here. 
everything we need to grow the vegetables is here, we save our own seeds. And also because we distribute so hyper-locally, very little can get in the way of getting our produce to the people who need it. So in that way, CSA has proven to be such a resilient, stable model for any kind of crises that come in the future. So why is it that you chose CSA as a model for Glass Bryn? So for us, I mean, CSA or Community Supported Agriculture as a model is far more forgiving uh, and supportive to this kind of food production. If you compare it to, say, doing farmers markets or trying to sell to shops, um, there's quite a lot of risk in that. We could take a whole bunch of produce to a farmers market on a Saturday and not sell it all. And we'd have to bring a whole bunch of produce, which is already past its best, back to the farm here. And we'd have to try to make use of it or we'd have to waste it. Whereas with our model where our members sign up for the whole season in advance and signing up for whatever's coming out of the land, it means that everything we grow is accounted for. Everything we grow is sold in advance. And that's a huge thing for producers because it, it means you've got the finances up front that you need to start the season. A lot of our costs are at the beginning of the year in the early spring, but it also means we're guaranteed not to waste anything because everything has a home to go to. We don't have to use plastic packaging because we don't have to keep things fresh for that long. You know, we harvest it here in the morning and it's in our members' kitchens in the afternoon. It reduces the need for refrigeration, the transport, all of these kind of parts of the food system that are very wasteful, very energy intensive and quite polluting are eradicated from the CSA model. And we're able to focus on producing really good food agroecologically and feeding the people that live hyper local within 10 mile radius of the farm here. Do you personally see a future in the CSA as a model for uh, farming and agriculture? Absolutely. I think it really is the model for the future. You know, it's something, it's something quite new and, you know, it's new to us in our modern food culture, but I think it's also something very old. It's based on various different systems that have been developed around the world throughout recent history to kind of create fair and accessible ways to distribute produce within communities, to create a fair income for farmers. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really looking to older systems to inspire how we can create a food system that is um, sustainable, that supports the kind of farming we need um, but also that makes food accessible, you know, this kind of food accessible to all people and not just a privilege of those with money. Throughout farming and different types of food systems, it really supports any kind of farming or food production, even grains. You know, we have community supported fermentation schemes or community supported bakeries, but I think it can extend beyond food. I think it's a really great model for all business, community supported businesses where customers, people who benefit from the business, become invested emotionally and financially um, in the success or failure of that business. Because I think that's the only realistic way that we can have resilient businesses that provide the vital services that people need. For me, nothing comes close to it really as a model. And, and you know, taking that whole, you know, if we talk about permaculture, taking a whole systems approach to the design of more regenerative health and life giving systems, then you know, CSA really embodies that for me. It's like a holistic model for how we can approach social and ecological, cultural well-being through our food systems and through farming. And that's, yeah, that's why we've never, we've never wavered from it. We've never diver diverged from CSA because it's always made the most sense for us um, as growers. And uh, we will continue to do it long into the future, I hope. Yeah, tiny one. Wow, look at that. That's what I want. Do you want to eat the baby one? Give it just a big pull downwards. Yeah. Oh, well done. That's a good one. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, dear, dear. Peasy <laughs> peasy. You, you can go now. Uh, yeah, that's uh, it. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any tips or fundamental kind of bullet points that, for someone who is just starting out a CSA? So I would encourage you to go and visit as many as you can, um, many CSAs as you can. Um, there's 
There's around 100, I think, in the UK at the moment, but there's they obviously exist in the US and Australia and all around the world. So, um, yeah, I'd encourage you to go and spend time on CSA farms, maybe go and volunteer, um, talk to the farmers, the producers, the people leading the CSAs, and get involved in uh, organizations like the CSA Network UK or the Land Workers Alliance. Check out what's already happening. Don't just go in there thinking there's it's a desert, you know, there's nothing happening because there might already be CSAs and maybe you can work in relationship with those because that's what we need in the CSA movement is, is relationship between producers um, and to eradicate that kind of sense of competition. I would say really figure out what kind of CSA you want to run. Are you going to be a big field scale producing everything yourself kind of CSA? Or maybe you'll be a CSA who produces, you know, a proportion of the box yourself, the share yourself, and then works with other growers to produce the other things. Maybe you work in collective Maybe you're a producer-led CSA, so it's all on you as the grower, or maybe it's a community-led CSA or a voluntary CSA. You know, CSA, one of the other real benefits of it is that it can work at any scale. So it's totally scalable as a way to distribute your um, surplus vegetables, right? So you've got the vegetables you need to produce for yourself, but maybe you just run a small-scale CSA with five or six boxes um, where you're, again finding a market finding a place to distribute any excess vegetables that you might have so even if you just got together with a group of friends um got you know managed to get hold of a field and wanted to grow just enough to feed all of you and a few extra people that's you know still embodying the principles and spirit of csa um, so the beauty of it is whether you've got five members or 150 members um, those same principles those same ethics the same benefits of csa can apply i'd also recommend uh, a course that I made with Jason, who's behind the camera. We worked together on a course for this new platform called Earthed, um, which is a nature skills and regenerative um, agriculture platform. Um, and I filmed a course called Why CSA is the Future. And in there, I've got all the tips and tricks to tell you how to think about starting a CSA, why CSA is important, how you need to go about setting it up, um, things like community building, getting people involved, crop planning, finding land, all these kind of things are covered in the course. Uh, it's a really great platform and that's coming out in November. So look out for that. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's it. Okay, Q and A section to the video. Thinking, keeping it nice and brief today. So we just got one question, which still blows my mind that we're actually reaching people so far we're getting, I don't know, a couple of hundred views on some of these and to have comments from yourselves in different countries that are benefiting and uh, potentially and hopefully inspired by these videos. Oh, it's, yeah, it, it makes me want to do it and, and keep doing it because not only do I love making these films and love doing stuff with Abel, it does, it is difficult sometimes because this channel isn't earning money and um, yeah, certainly not a, a business in any way shape or form um, so so yeah so comments like that and to know that it is actually benefiting people out there really helps but I digress okay this question was posted in the comment of last month's video so if you'd like to have a question post to Abel in future videos that's where to put them and this is so after saying a very nice um, message about the how inspired the, he is about the other videos that we've made he had a question what systems or software do you use to track your finances crop planning csa subscriptions etc it seems like there's a whole online industry out there promising more efficient farm management for a fee of course yeah good question i notice i feel a pressure to have some fancy answer for this but i don't i don't really um, but what I hope my answer will do will will show you that um, all of these fancy tools that they're trying to sell you are probably not necessary. Um, so pretty much everything we do uh, on that end of things is, is through Google Workspace. So the Google Suite. Um, so that is Google Spreadsheets, um, which is all linked up to our email accounts and is all linked up to our Squarespace website where we get signups for our veg boxes, for example. So that's as complicated as it gets really. So our signups on the website go straight into a spreadsheet, which makes, which we then process manually. Cause you know, look, we only have like 50, 60 members max. So, well, we've only had 50 to 60 max. So that's not that many to kind of process into a 
So we take our spreadsheet that's automatically generated and we put that into our own list with a few extra details that we need to add. And then also spreadsheets are great for creating crop plans, for example. So we have this really cool crop planning tool, which is a, basically a, just a, a spreadsheet with lots of functions built into it so that we can sort of bring together a cropping calendar together with um, data around yields. So we have certain, you might have certain average yield from a meter of bed. And this is where I talked in a few videos ago about how having uniform width beds is really helpful because then you have, our spreadsheet essentially means we just type in the length of bed and that'll tell us what the yield's gonna be or how many plants we need to sow or all these things are kind of inbuilt to work together. So that's something um, I could probably share with people if they wanted. Um, or we can make a video about. Or we can make a special video about it, so stay tuned for that. If there's anything out there that you guys are interested in specifically about this, then let us know down in the comments. But I think it'd be an interesting kind of tutorial video for Abel to maybe take us through this topic and maybe even, you know, simple as this is how to set up the spreadsheet, this is how to kind of fill it out, this is how to make sums and kind of update it um, as the year goes on. What yeah. do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm no expert. Like, I'm. this is an area that I... Yeah, it's always the well, it's the least exciting, <laughs> least sexy part of running something like this. And definitely any advice... I'll do some sexy lighting, that's fine. We can put some sexy lighting on. You can speak like this. <laughs> I'll dress all sexy speak into for the it. microphone and say, no, um, this, this is how I do a spreadsheet. But what I would say is like find someone, or ideally have someone on your team who loves doing this kind of stuff. That was, that's the best thing, really, because I don't love doing it. And, but I guess as we're on the theme this month of uh, CSAs and why they work and why we, why we use that model is that actually CSA makes all of that stuff a lot simpler. Yields wise, you're not saying like, I have to have this amount for this week because I've got a wholesale customer who wants it. Or, or for example, you're not dealing with like hundreds of customers every week wanting different things. You know, hundred, you know, they might have like a hundred different orders with different things in them. It's like we have, beginning of the year, we have our however many members we have their data and their information that goes in a list and then that's it. It's like, that's the, that's the admin apart from a bit of emailing and a bit of like communication with our members. That's, that's as complicated as it gets. And I, so I really would emphasize again, that it's, it's such a forgiving model for, for growers because it takes so much of the ad, you know, imagine you're getting a hundred orders a week from your website that all have different, vegetables, you know, different orders. And it's like, you've got to process all of those and you've got to process them individually and pack them all in. But if you have 50 members who are getting the same veg, they're all getting the same veg, it's whatever's coming out of the land. You've collected all their information once and they're going to be the same members all the way through. Granted, you might have a little change of like, you might pick up a few members, you might lose a few members, but generally speaking, like that's going to be the, the same people you have all year. So yeah, we just do, we've typically done just like one big day at the beginning of the year, once we've got all our member signups, process that list, get our list together. And that's that gives us all the data we need for making sure we've got enough different vegetables and stuff. And so we just grow for that amount of members. Um, but we know that whatever we grow is gonna be sold to them. So yeah, my advice around tools would be, you do be a CSA, because it makes the need for tools a lot less. <laughs> yeah. Bro? Yeah good way to end the topic uh, end this video <laughs> especially considering the topic yeah. so um thank you everyone and we'll see you next month see you in september <laughs>